Matthew chapter 24, from the next few Wednesday nights, we're going to continue in this series that we began on Jesus' teaching on the end times, and we have reflected on Matthew 24 and 25, what we call the Olivet Discourse. We find it also in Mark chapter 13 and Luke 21. Matthew gives us a fuller understanding of Jesus' teaching on the end times, and that's the reason that we are looking there. But also, Matthew writes to Jewish believers, Jewish Christians. Not only Christians, but he wrote it to Jews so that they might put their faith in Christ as the true Messiah. But as we've been looking, just to kind of get a, a recap, and I know you version can do crazy things sometimes, and, and uh, I was told that it may be up, it may be down sometimes. Tonight, I'm not sure if it is. It's not up. Again, not up. It is up. Okay, some of you say yes, and some of you, I, I don't know what happened. I'm not, you know, technology is funny, isn't it? In fact, Zach came to me right before service and says, hey, the board's down. <laughs> so I don't know, you know, we're going to give it a few minutes and pray over it, maybe slap it, kick it, spit on it, anoint it with oil, whatever we need to do, and, and it came up. So I don't know, maybe you need to slap, kick, anoint it with oil, whatever you need to do on the Bible app or throw it. Yes, just make sure, uh, you know, who's in front of you that you don't pop them in the head when you throw <laughs> Uh, but Matthew 24, we're going to look at verses 42 through 51, Lord willing. We're looking at the different parables now that Jesus speaks of in regards to his teaching on the end times. But just giving a recap, it's Tuesday, it's the week leading up to Passover. Jesus is in Jerusalem with his disciples, and they are leaving the temple area. Jesus has already been in intense discussion with the Pharisees and the scribes. And they're leaving the temple, and we know that one of the disciples, maybe multiple of the disciples, said, Jesus, look at the glory of the temple buildings. And it was a sight to behold in the ancient world. Definitely one of the wonders of the world, Solomon's temple and the buildings in the temple complex. But Jesus tells the disciples not to put their hope and their faith in this building because he prophesies of its destruction. And sometime in the course of their journey in leaving Jerusalem, making their way up the Mount of Olives to Bethany where they had been spending the nights and coming back to Jerusalem in the day, the disciples ask, in fact, we understand that it was Andrew, Peter, and John and James that really got along with Jesus and said, you know, when is this going to happen? When is the destruction of the temple going to take place? And particularly about your return and the sign of the end time. And so Jesus begins to cite for them things that will take place to lead to his second coming. And in verse 5 of Matthew 24, he talks about false prophets coming in his name. In 6 and 7, he talks about the occurrence of wars and natural disasters, the persecution of Christians in verse 9, the rise and success of these false prophets that will lead believers to betray, betray the truth of who Christ is and enter into a state of apostasy. Verses 10 and 11, hatred that will be just grown in this time. And verse 14 is on a good note because Jesus speaks of the worldwide preaching of the gospel. And Jesus says these things will be the major events and movements of the age between his first coming and his second coming. In verses 15 through 28, he talks about a time of great 
tribulation. And in that time of great tribulation, he refers to the prophet Daniel's words in regards to the abomination of desolation and talking about, you know, the Antichrist, that there is a past meaning here, but also a future meaning and even a near future meaning as we've been looking about that some believe that this speaks of the Romans as they came to Jerusalem in AD 70 and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and set up their monikers or their standards that spoke of Rome and its power and its authority and and even its false gods. And like I said, speaking to the Antichrist that Daniel speaks of, but also revelations that when he, the Antichrist, would come into the temple and set himself up as God, the abomination of desolation. And even during the present near understanding of this, that Jesus says when this moment takes place, which many believe was when Rome, that near fulfillment of it, when the temple was destroyed, Jesus says that the people who are in Jerusalem, the city, they are to leave, they are to flee, they are not to stay. The remainder, after verse 28 of Matthew 24, Jesus takes up the disciples' second question, which was, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And we understand the sign of his coming and the end of the age that that they work together. And not only does the remainder of the chapter, as we're going to look tonight, Lord willing, deal with when the Son of Man will return to earth, his second coming, it also deals with, we notice, the kind of conduct that is required of Jesus' disciples, his followers. And he gives no indication at the exact time of his return, although we have individuals that have tried to pinpoint that day. You remember 88 reasons why Jesus is going to return in 1988, or, you know, it didn't happen in 88, so he says, you know what, let's try 89. So 89 reasons of why Jesus is going to return in 1989, which would have been great, you know. We'd have been in heaven right now. (laughs) So it would have been great for the believers. And there's been individuals before that time and even after that have tried to pinpoint dates. But Jesus strictly said in verse 36, as we looked at last Wednesday, but about that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father alone. And it may seem peculiar that Jesus would say that he even himself at that moment did not know, but We talked about how that this doctrine of how that Jesus laid aside his deity to become fully man. That in this moment, in doing the Father's will, as he stated, that's the reason I came, and that's what motivates me and leads me is to do God's will. It wasn't about his second coming. It was all about his first coming, which was for the cross and the resurrection, so that we could have hope of a second coming. And most believe that now that he is one with the Father and he has all authority, that he is knowledgeable of that day. Whether you believe that or not, I don't believe that I'll keep you out of heaven. Which way you may fall there. Just throwing it out for your information. But Jesus does reveal that many people, just giving a short recap before we get to verse 42 again, He does reveal that many people in waiting for his second return will go on living as though this life is all there is. And their personal success is all that matters. And he even references that the time leading up to his second coming will be like, in verse 37, like the days of Noah. They just live their life like normal. Normal things going on. Mary, giving him marriage. All of these different things, just the normal things of life that will go on. And and there will be individuals that will be so caught up in living in this life that they will be like the people in Noah's day. They will miss God's redemption, which in that time was the ark. Even as we know in reading Genesis' account that Noah definitely preached. He preached through his labor on the ark and It's most, or I should say a lot, believe that there was verbal proclamation to individuals that come by. Hey, Noah, what you doing? I'm building an ark. I'm building a boat. (laughs) I mean, because it was big, and I know it was huge. And I'll say it one time. I won't say it again because I said it a lot last Wednesday. 
So there had to be speculation and wondering because we're very curious individuals, aren't we? Just let there be a fire. Everybody gravitates to it, right? Like bugs to a light. (laughs) But he preached through his actions and all, but yet they did not listen. And when God put them into the ark and shut the door, it was too late. And there will be individuals like that upon Christ's second coming. But as we understand in illustrating the time of Noah and Noah's family, that that attitude of not being ready should not be found and must not be found among God's children because we are looking for his imminent return. And that just that whole concept of his imminent return is that he come at any moment, any moment. And as Jesus emphasizes the need for preparedness and watching on the part of his disciples, he turns to four different parables, as we alluded to last Wednesday, that gives variations on the theme of preparedness and and watching. But each of these parables teach a particular point about how and why we need to be prepared. The homeowner and the thief, verses 42 and 44 of Matthew 24, the good and the wicked servant, verses 45 through 51, and then the two that we're very familiar with, the ten virgins, the five wise, the five foolish, of the first 13 verses of Matthew 25, and then the parable of the talents in verses 14 through 30 of Matthew 25. The imminence of his return is what is stressed in these parables. So let's begin tonight with the parable of the homeowner and the thief. Can we read together verses 42 through 43? Jesus says, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this. In other words, what is Jesus saying here? You can count on it. You can count on it. It's emphatic. That if the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you must be ready as well, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour when you do not think he will. Father, open our hearts to receive your word tonight through the ministry of Holy Spirit, that you may perfect your work in But, Lord, even more so, perfect it through us, through us being a witness of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. Lord, we ask and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, so, Jesus loved using parables, stories that were thrown alongside how we need to be living. The parable of the sower, we know. All the different parables that Jesus used. Many parables to teach his point. And in using this parable of the homeowner and the thief, Jesus shows that our spiritual vigilance as his children should be like that of a homeowner who knew a thief was coming. This is the South, right? It's the South. You don't come on our property uninvited, right? You risk getting what? Shot. Shot. See, just about everybody saying, you just don't do it. In fact, you don't see some of the craziness, some of the craziness, taking place with these squatters and all in the South that you do in other places because they're going to get shot, (laughs) right? There's consequences to your foolishness. So we can understand, you know, being watchful and how Jesus uses this parable, in saying that the homeowner, if he'd known when the thief was coming, he would have kept guard at all times. Day or night, it wouldn't matter. He would have been there, the homeowner would, waiting for him, that he would have been greeted with two barrels or whatever he had, pitchfork or whatever. You understand what I'm, what I'm getting at. And the same imagery is used by Paul, it's used by Peter, and it's also used by John. 1 Thessalonians 5.2, Paul uses it this way. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord is coming just like a thief in the night. 
or Peter, 2 Peter 3 in verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be broken. And then John uses it in Revelation 3, 3, in talking to the church in Sardis. He says, so remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Then if you are not alert, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. So Jesus is talking about being prepared, perpetually prepared and In this, when Jesus stated this, therefore be on the alert, we understand it's in the present tense, so it means there should never be a point in time in our lives spiritually that we're not spiritually alert and aware. And notice in verse 44, it carries the chain of the argument, the links. It continues to link together. And as disciples of Christ, we are in essentially the position of the homeowner. We understand that. And do not know when Jesus is coming. So therefore, Jesus calls on us as his followers to always be ready. And he repeats the reason. It is because they do not know. We do not know the time of the return, and we must live in a state of constant preparedness because Jesus says once again in verse 44, the Son of Man is coming. Now, we talked about end-time events when we read Matthew 24, 25, Mark 13, Luke 21, even the things that are spoken of in the epistles and especially in Revelation or in Daniel, Daniel. Daniel, every time I try to say Daniel now, I always go back to that because that's in my mind. <laughs> I called the guy that is working on our security stuff. I call him Daniel. And I have to say, I'm sorry, Daniel. <laughs> so sorry about that. That was just, uh, it, it just, it's the way it is. It doesn't matter. But anyway, I'll get off of that and get back to this. Jesus is coming. So when we talk about end time events, keep the main thing the main thing. There is a lot of Differing opinions, right? Differing opinions. Some people get fighting mad about the differing opinions. But when we talk about end time events, keep the main thing the main thing. And the biggest of it all is Jesus is coming back. He says the Son of Man is coming. Therefore, it leaves no doubt of the fact Jesus is coming back. And his coming is a certainty on which we, as his disciples and his children, must set our minds upon. Keep it fixed there, because you know what? This world, just like today, 14-year-old individual goes to school and does something very foolish. Four individuals lost their life today. Kids, nine others, I believe, were injured in North Georgia at a high school. And it's tragic. But these are the things that will be taking place that Jesus said until his second coming. And we know he's coming back. We don't know the time. We know he is. We just don't know the time. And Jesus here uses an analogy. He associates himself or It's not himself. What he associates is his coming as a thief. He doesn't associate himself as a thief, but his coming as the coming of a thief. There's a difference. You know, he also associated God with the unjust judge, did he, in Luke 18? You remember? So that he would affirm to us we need to be persistent in the way that we seek after God. Just like the widow woman that would not stop pestering the unjust judge, and finally to the point the man says, she is going to kill me if I don't meet her request. So you know what I'm going to do so that I can get rid of her? I'm going to meet her demand. And Jesus says, if an individual will do that, how much more will your heavenly Father 
through our persistence in seeking his heart and seeking his presence and seeking his strength and just seeking him, that God will answer and be there for us because he's not an unjust judge. And here he associates his coming with that, the coming of a thief. It's unexpected and it's unpleasant. Anybody ever have your car or anything broken into? You just feel violated, don't you? I mean, you really do. You feel violated and mad. You know, my dad always said, I can't, there's one thing in the world I can't stand, and that's a thief. <laughs> thief and a liar. <laughs> but it ranks up there being violated. But when you associate his coming with that of the thief, it, it speaks to being unexpected, but it also speaks to the unpleasant it, unpleasant nature of his return for those who are not prepared. He's not a thief, but his coming will be, and therefore it will be unpleasant and unexpected to those who are not prepared to meet him when he comes. And then he moves on to the next illustration that really, it is like the first of the homeowner and the thief But it makes that point, but it really dives into how we need to be living and how we are ready in a practical sense as believers. Look at verse 45. Second parable. Who then is the faithful and sensible slave or servant whom his master put in charge of his household slaves? to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes or returns. Truly I say to you, that here's another emphatic statement. Every time you know, the King James says truly, truly, emphasize, but it's the same thing. It's an emphatic statement. Truly I say to you that that servant, or I should say the master, will put that servant in charge of all his possessions. In other words, he will get a promotion. (laughs) But if that evil servant or slave says in their heart, verse 48, my master is not coming for a long time. And he begins to beat his fellow slaves and he eats and drinks with those habitually drunk, you know, just living a careless life. Then the master of that slave will come on a day that he does not expect, and in an hour that he does not know, and he will cut him in two and assign him a place with the hypocrites, which alludes back to, he says, hey, I say in my heart. In other words, he's whispering to himself, but he may be saying something else on the outside. I will cut him in two and assign him a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be, and here's the phrase that used to scare the fool out of me as a kid, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Did that, just, did that ever unnerve you when you, you first heard that preach? I know it, it, it did, especially when I was a kid. It, it unnerved me. Weeping. And gnashing of teeth. That just sounds bad. I didn't understand what I understood the weeping part, the gnashing of teeth. I really didn't understand. It just didn't sound good when I was a kid. But this parable of the good and the evil servant makes a similar point, like I said, as the homeowner and the thief. Hang with me, hang with me. But it also indicates, like I stated before, what being ready will mean in practical terms. In practical terms, in layman's terms, if you will. This parable, it describes a servant who is given overall authority as a steward because the possessions are not the servants, right? It's his master's. But the master has given him control and stewardship of all that he has during his absence. And Jesus says the faithful servant works at their task, committed to the task that the master had given. So when the master returns at his choosing, all will be in order. Jesus even said, when the Son of Man returns to the earth, will he find what? 
faith. Faith is our obedience to God's commands, right? The way he's told us to live, the things he's told us to be doing. And Jesus says, when I return, will I find faith, active faith? James says, faith we just talk about isn't faith at all. Are we living it out? James even says, you say you have faith? Well, I will prove my faith by the way I live. And this parable really speaks to that. It speaks to being ready in practical terms. When the master comes back with the faithful servant and finds that servant having good stewardship, working at all the things at which they should be working, what does Jesus say the master will do to that servant? One word. Starts with a B, ends with a D. Blessed, right? Blessed. That's an awesome word. Because Jesus talked about that word, blessed, in Matthew chapter 5. What we call the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who... Poor in spirit. Mourn. Individuals who are kingdom-minded, they're blessed. And that word means to be fully satisfied. Fully satisfied. And in the New Testament, it was used of joy that comes from our salvation. Absolutely, we are blessed. But it also describes the condition or state of being in God's favor and grace. And isn't that what Jesus is saying about the faithful steward? of the master's household, that when he comes back and finds the faithful servant doing what he had told him to do, he will receive favor from his master. And the solemn truly, I tell you, emphasizes that the following words are significant. The master will promote the faithful servant. They're promoted. I I can't wait to get promoted. How about you? Promoted from here to heaven. I mean, seriously, I can't wait to hear those words of promotion. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. Now I will make you what? Rulers over many. It connects with this parable. So Here, Jesus says the servant can exercise their stewardship well, as verses 45, 46, and 47 alludes to, or they can do it badly. That's verses 48, 49, 50, and 51 thrown in there as well. And Jesus says, unlike the faithful servant that stewarded his master's household well, the evil servant reasons within his heart. He reasons inside about the delay of his master's return. In his heart, like we talked about on Sunday from Proverbs 4 and verse 23, it signifies this servant's inner being, who he really is. This is not what he says to other people, but the thinking that governs his actions. And what was the thinking that governed his actions? Verse 48, my master is not coming for a long time. I'm good. I can just do whatever I want and coast. He does not ask how long the delay will be, but he seizes on the fact that he will not have to give an account of himself for quite some time. And he acts... For all the world, as though the delay had somehow removed all possibility that his master would ever come back. This is what Jesus is alluding to. And this evil servant, this wicked servant, takes advantage of his temporary superiority to beat his fellow servants. Fellow servants. He uses his temporary authority to inflict hardship on others, to act in cruelty. And Jesus adds in here self-indulgence, doesn't he? Because it says he goes off and he eats, he drinks with the drunkards, which speaks of excess, living in excess 
out of the master's command. And this speaks of this servant's self-indulgence as well as a lack of care in discharging his function in a way that honored his master. He was not a good steward. Not a good steward. And verse 50 tells us, then the master of that slave will come on a day that he does not expect. Why does he not expect? Because he doesn't believe. When the Son of Man comes back, will he find faith? Faith is not just what we say. Faith is what we do. It's how we live. And the faithful steward presented living faith, didn't he? My master is coming back. Therefore, I'm going to be busy doing what he has tasked me to do until he returns. But we find with the wicked servant, there isn't faith. Because he doesn't believe because of the way he lives. And the master comes back on a day that he doesn't expect and at an hour that he does not know. And Jesus here again in verse 50 is underlining the truth that delay does not mean cancellation. Because did not Peter say the reason the father delays is because of his grace? Because of his grace. We're ready to go home. You know what? I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to go home. (laughs) Are y'all ready to go home? (laughs) I'm not talking about going to your house. You'll get there in a minute, I promise. (laughs) But I'm ready to go home. This world's gone crazy. It's gone crazy. But even as much as I want to go home, may what drive It's me is that the reason that the Lord would delay his return is there are still people who aren't ready. When the master does return, getting back to the story, this evil servant who proved to be ineffective and interested only in his own self-indulgence Jesus says that individual will be relegated to the place of the hypocrites. Say one thing, live another way. And the whole welling and the grinding of teeth, the gnashing of teeth, is definitely a proverbial expression that Matthew uses quite often. Matthew uses it quite often. It's somewhat rare in the rest of the New Testament. But it's a phrase that is used to describe despair. Despair. And it stands for the anguish and the suffering of those forever removed from the presence of God. They didn't believe he would return. Then when he returns, they're caught. The time of grace is over. I know there's different opinions on what Matthew 24 and these parables, and we don't have enough time to to hit the the two that are most well-known. We'll try to do that next Wednesday, but that's the parable of the virgins and also of the talents. And we shouldn't try to press ideals and force them into the Scripture. Keep the main thing the main thing. That's the safe. There's nothing wrong with discussing and listening to other ideas, but don't get removed from the core of why Jesus is saying what he's saying. Be ready, because I'm coming back. But here in this story about the faithful steward and the wicked servant, Jesus teaches us what it means to live a life of preparedness and being ready. It's not just about what we say, it's about how are we living. This parable helps to give more of a concrete meaning to being ready. Being ready does not involve simply idleness by just sitting and quietly waiting, but providing for the household. Providing. And, you know, let's talk about the scope of the household. Isn't the scope of the household God's creation? Because he's the master, right? And he owns everything. 
So it's not just about my life. It's not just about my few. It's about the whole world. This parable stresses that it is in service to others that we prepare for the return of Christ. Are we at work because we know, as Jesus says, there is an hour coming that no man will be ever to work. Work while it is still day. Work while it is still a time of grace because there is coming the night when he returns that grace will be offered no more. And I'm talking at the end of all things. When everybody will see him, Revelation speaks of. And then we'll get to, in Matthew, to the separating of the sheep and the goats. Living a life that is ready and watchful for our Lord's return involves active, laborious, reasonable service of faith. And as we close tonight, I I just, I am going to share this. I'm not saying that it's earth-shattering. Leading into a series next Sunday, Lord willing, in the book of Haggai. And just the work that God has called us to. And not forcing in our work into what the remnant was doing there in rebuilding the temple. But it was the work of God, right? And we have a work as well. But it's just what the Lord has been rehearsing in our hearts, even from the 1st of January, that we need to turn. Not that we don't have our sights outside, but we need to increase it. And as I was sitting here, before it was during worship, before Pastor Ed ever got up to share, if you remember, with Teen Challenge. And and like I'm saying, this is not earth shattering. But as we were worshiping, the Lord just reaffirmed in my heart, because I've been praying and just leaning this way with the Lord, that if you will turn your gaze outside, I'll fill the seats. And I'm not just talking about a seat being filled so we can say, man, look, we had this number here. And man, we have this number. It's not about that. The whole concept of the seat was a soul. Because true growth is not about numbers. True growth is about somebody who was living in the world and now they're in Christ. That's true growth, spiritual growth. And then just what the Lord is leading us in this season to, that the Lord just stirred that in my spirit. If you will increase your gaze outside and your mind outside, yes, there's stuff to be done in the building. And we're going to be doing stuff in the building, discipleship and and leadership to support growth. Because if we don't have the leadership and we don't have the training here, the growth can come in. But if if the support factors aren't here, it's going to crumble. So yes, we're going to do the things in the building that we need to do, but it's about turning, increasing our gaze outside. The Lord stirred that. I know it's not earth shattering. What I'm saying is I'm not telling you something you don't know. But for me, I've been praying there, and the Lord affirmed that. If you turn your gaze outward, I'll fill the seats. And I know God spoke that to me. And that's what we're going to be doing. It's what we're doing now with embrace grace and embrace life. Matt's about to start an outreach at Lisenby Elementary School and reaching the dads with their kids. That, that, that's on the forefront now. I'm, I'm about to engage in training that the district has made available in regards to rural community chaplaincy. And it's training for about six months, intense training for six months, to how in a rural community you can engage and look in ways to evaluate your community and turning our gaze outward. I'm just saying there are things practically in motion. And that's what this is talking about tonight. I, I know I've taken longer than normal, but guys, this is why we're here. It's why we're here. It's what we're about. It's what God's about. Our being ready It's not just about sitting and waiting. It's about, do my actions show that I'm ready? And that's not just about keeping my life clean by the means of his grace and Holy Spirit and me growing in my faith. 
and my family, but it's about doing the things outside these doors because there are people who aren't ready. And that's why the Lord hasn't come back yet. There are still yet people to be touched with the life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we living that way? Father, Lord, I just pray by your Holy Spirit, oh, stir us, oh God. Stir us. Lord, you have been. This, this whole year, you have been stirring us and moving us, oh God, in turning our gaze. Not that this church hasn't had their eyes on the outside because they have. We have. But Lord, you are calling us to greater works, to turn even in a greater way and to increase our footstep outside of this building, Lord, to the lost. Are we, are we living lives that are ready for your return? It doesn't just speak to the fact that, Lord, we're living according to your will, but it also speaks, am I sharing the good news of the message of Christ because I know the hour is late? That also speaks to my preparedness. I know why you're delaying, because there are souls yet to be saved. Lord, stir our hearts. Continue to stir our hearts. Oh, we all have a place of being a faithful steward of what you've given us. And what we're a steward of is the gospel, the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, God, help us. God, help us. God, help us be good stewards, to be good stewards of the saving message. Oh, God. Come on, can you just pray that? Just make an altar right where you are. Can we just pray that, Lord, stir my spirit. Stir my spirit. Do you not, do you not sense his presence tonight? Do you not sense the heart of God? For the lost. For the lost. The stirring of the Spirit. Moving us to be good stewards. Good stewards. God, help me to be a good steward. Help us to be good stewards. Help us to do our part, Lord. Oh, God. Help us to see the world as you see the world. Sometimes all we can see is the craziness of the world. But Lord, help us to look with your eyes. To feel and to sense with your heart the world, the lost.